So tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Liz King. Liz was a geology major at Carleton College in Minnesota. Mineralogy and petrology were her most difficult classes, so she decided she should spend her career as a mineralogist and petrologist. Her undergraduate thesis was on the granitic rocks of Mount Desert Island, Maine. Could be another talk. Uh, and that is where her love of granite began. Her master's and PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where she moved into stable isotope geochemistry and granitic rocks. She worked on rocks of the Superior Province in Canada, the Idaho Batholith to our west, and granites in the basin and range, looking at how our continent grew through time and what the metamorphic events these rocks enjoyed. Liz spent eight years on the faculty of Illinois State University, so she got tenure, and then of course she quit and moved to Jackson. Good move. <laughs> uh, these days, and for quite a while now, she's been the development coordinator for the Teton Literacy Center. Uh, she also teaches intro geology and historical geology at Western Wyoming Community College and Northern Virginia Community College. The Q and A. Uh, Excellent. Thanks, Mike. Is my microphone working, hopefully? Um, thank you all for being here. Thanks for being on Zoom. Um, the initial title to my talk tonight was uh, going to be Undercover Geology at a Lead Zinc Mine in Nepal. Um, and I was undercover because the mining company never really knew my intention of being there. Um, I, I honestly didn't really know my intention of being there either, but they sure didn't think that I was there uh you know to try and study the environmental impact of a lead zinc mine and um they honestly thought that as a you know a geology major from the states i was there going to be helping their their case to try and get development going because they were still in the pre-development phase um so it was a little bit of a cat and mouse game up there which was interesting um you know i thought that there were going to be a lot of environmental policies that were going to be broken at the mine Turns out it's in Nepal. They're not really any environmental policy. So I had to really shift my mindset being up there. Um, and it turned, I mean, still it was a very fascinating uh, case for what's going on up at the mine. Um, but, you know, certainly as we'll see, many rumors, many mistruths about the mine, about what I was doing there, uh, what the, you know, why it all was going down uh, at this high altitude lead zinc mine. Um, and it really is a snapshot of where I was uh, at the time of my semester abroad. So it's, not going to be super scientific -y. So some of you may sigh, uh, deep sigh of relief. Some of you may be a little upset, but we'll try and balance it out. Um, so just some background, what I was doing is uh, fall 1992. So quite a while ago, my junior year, I was at Carleton College as a uh, geology major. And I was a technology and policy studies minor, which morphed into environmental policy and politics, essentially. Um, I traveled to Nepal for a semester with School for International Training, which is still in existence in Vermont, and they have school programs um, all over the world. But uh, I decided to go to Nepal as the, the you know, the, as a geology student, as an obvious draw there, the Himalayas. Um, there were about two dozen American students on the program. It turns out, ironically, three of them were from Carlson, um, which was a total fluke, and one of the other ones I actually knew from previous Knowles courses. Uh, so it was a very small world. Um, and I put my academics list up there, at least my geology courses up there so far as reference, because I'd only had intro, geomorphology, paleobiology, and structural geology at this point in my life. I had not had mineralogy, and this will come into play later because the mine was having me log core, drill core for the UN development project. And I was like, what, is that the blue mineral? <laughs> <laughs> I had clearly no idea what I was doing up there, and they, they didn't either. Um, but the mine was counting on my structural geology and mineralogy background uh, in order to help their case with the UN and, and get their funding. Is that better? Okay. Uh, all right, so just to get again, background on our semester there before we dive into the mine. We got there to Kathmandu in September. Uh, we had intense, intense language classes uh, all day, basically, uh, once we got there, as soon as we got on the ground. And then um, after we sort of got settled, we took bus ride with the, everyone in the school, and then trekked into the village of Toplajung, which is over here in far eastern Nepal, um, probably about a two or three day trek from the end of the road. Uh, and we had language class on the trail. So this was my group for the morning with our language teacher, Joti, right there. And 
um, nothing but time to learn the language as you're trekking along. <clears throat> Uh, after our probably two weeks in Tapeljung, where we had a homestay family visit with uh, with at least one other student as moral support, they turned us loose and let us meet back at the road uh, when our bus was leaving. So we had multiple options for how we were going to get back there. I went with a group that went north, and we wanted to go see if we could see Kachinjunga, which is up here um, on the very border. I'm and sorry, uh, this is Mike. World. Liz, Liz, you're you're not the Zoom audience is not seeing the slides advance. Oh, interesting. <laughs> uh, let's see. We'll pause it doesn't here. also. It doesn't look like you're in the presentation right. view. Okay, you briefly were, but yeah. Are the slides advancing for you now, Mike? No, I don't see any slides at all. I'm just looking I'm at you. Stopped. You have to share your screen again. Well, hang on. You stop sharing. Yep. Stop sharing. Hang on. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to go back a slide, Mike. Does anything happen in there? Yeah, um, we're still see we're not seeing the presentation view. We are seeing your slide though. Uh, you could go back another one just to see. Okay. The slide change just then? No, it didn't change. Are they moving? And forward? you're not you're not in presentation view. In other words, we're seeing your list of slides on the left side of the screen. Okay. okay. Now so we're seeing the presentation view. Okay. Well, we're, now we're back to the non-presentation view. Well, I can expand this. <laughs> um, I can just run it like this and just, if it's what big do you enough. See now, Mike? Well, we're seeing the, uh, okay, I haven't I seen a change and try, try, advance the slide. Okay. I'll... September intense language classes, track to Go ahead and one more. Okay, I'm seeing it advance. Okay. All right. All right. We're we'll still seeing the, the <laughs> you're still seeing your slides on the left side, but they're pretty small. Yeah, and so if I go to play slide, you it, it looks the right for me, but not on Zoom apparently. So yeah, you just cropped the slide <laughs> by doing we'll what you did. Okay, let's go for it. Yeah, okay. Well, let's, uh, <laughs> um, Where am I going? This oh, yeah. Drop that down and hide floating menu. menu. Meeting. Yeah. It might come back, but. Okay. All right. Well, go with slightly smaller, smaller version of the slides here. Um, okay. So anyway, we left the village. We took a couple of days to trek north towards uh, Kachinjunga. We didn't obviously get anywhere near to it. The weather was terrible during the whole trek. There's the end of the monsoons, but we were um, blessed, luckily, that the clouds split at sunrise one morning, barely. And that is all we got to see at Kachinjunga. And then the window closed and that was it. <laughs> Uh, okay, October for my semester, we were back in Kathmandu for the whole month doing language classes, culture seminars. They brought speakers to their schoolhouse for uh, things from art, music, politics, uh, you know, kind of everything under the sun to kind of introduce us to issues and uh, concerns in Nepal. Uh, we had a solo homestay. So this here is my homestay mother. Um, and then over here, I had two brothers and a sister. This is a random neighborhood kid, not in the family. Um, and it's hard to see everyone here, but this is my full family. There was a father and my, I had a grandmother as well. Um, we were in Kathmandu for uh, Halloween and we happened, it happened to be when Keanu Reeves was there filming The Little Buddha. So we invited him to our Halloween party. He sadly did not show up. Um, but I went as a Nepal truck and then a Tibetan woman and a, a movie star <clears throat> were some of the Halloween costumes. Uh, November in our semester was when we did our independent study projects or ISPs. And so every student in the group 
proposed a topic. I uh, had to have budget and a research proposal and all that. The school let us travel wherever we needed to in the country in order to get our ISP done. And it was every possible topic under the sun. There were um, some that went towards Everest to study yak cheese farming or yak cheese creation. Uh, someone was, did some work with the Communist Party that was kind of getting going. There was an election time in Nepal. Uh, some did some mo uh, monastery retreats. Uh, someone went up to Mustang that had literally opened that year to Western tourists um, and had some crazy experiences up there. Uh, I was in Kathmandu for most of it. Um, on the left <clears throat> here is a, a marble mine in Kathmandu. It was kind of my backup project if things didn't really work out with the lead zinc mine. Um, but I did obviously get to the lead zinc mine in the middle and then photo and then had enough time at the end. I went trekking in uh, Long Tong National Park um, as I wrote up my project. And then just to finish up our semester, uh, SIT did a really good job of integrating us back to Western lifestyle because we'd been so off the grid for so long um, and they didn't want to just put us on a plane back home after four months. And so we did a uh, rafting trip down uh, one of the major rivers and it felt like we were staying at the Four Seasons to roll into camp and have our tent set up for us. Uh, and then we went down in a, to Chitwan National Park for a safari. And again, to have hot water bottles in our bed was like like other wor otherworldly compared to what we've been doing. So that's how we finished things up. And then they put us all back in a plane back home. Okay, so my ISP, I met with uh, Rajendra Shestra, a geologist at the Department of Mines and Geology, and we're brainstorming topics. Um, you know, it was a primarily language and culture program, so they, they weren't really lined up in all these pre-programs um, STEM topics for me to be considering. So we brainstormed a lot of topics, um, phosphorite exploration, gemstones of Nepal, obviously a lot of engineering geology possibilities in Nepal and their roads and landslides. He was going to be doing some field work that I could have joined in on. Um, oil development in southern Nepal was fascinating, but everyone right away was like, oh, that's super secret. So I knew that was not going to go anywhere. Um, the Ganesh Himal project came up, and then that marble quarry south of Kathmandu. As, you know, so that was the marble quarry was my backup. There was going to be an interesting study nonetheless, and I did do a little work on it just in case. Um, but the Ganesh Himal was really intriguing uh, for a lot of different reasons. And it really sealed the deal when I found this Hamal magazine story from a couple of years before I was there, um, talking about resource development, ba balancing economic benefit, environmental impacts, and developing countries. And um, you know, so there was, I could tell there was going to be a lot going on in this project rather than just pure science. Um, so it was really interesting to me uh, to try and make this project work, but it was not going to be easy. Um, just some background research again in mining and environmentalism in Nepal. Uh, um, the 1966 Nepal Mines Act really was the first legislation on the books in Nepal. And pretty much all it said was that all the minerals are the property of His Majesty's government. Um, at this point, Nepal was still a uh, monarchy until um, early 2000s. Um, and so that, you know, things have changed a little bit now that they've gotten um, different government and a, a democratic government. Um, the next policy on their books was 1985 Mines and Minerals Act, um, saying that the, the government can limit mining in areas if there's uh, historical or religious importance, um, landowners can be compensated. Um, this is a difficult reality, though, because the Department of Mine and Geology is in Kathmandu, and these mines are scattered all over in incredibly remote areas of the country. So, um, you know, good in theory to have on the books, but it was going to be incredibly difficult uh, to have, have it really come into play. So the status of mining in Nepal in 1992, um, the government encouraged private sector to be involved. They realized they were not going to be able to take this on all by themselves and were looking towards external investors. And um, this was a big deal because Nepal, again, was still kind of opening up. It was open, but still really not fully open. So it really essentially meant India and China as their big investors. And um, there's a lot of politics between those countries. So it was a big move for them to uh, you know, even be open to the concept of India coming in and helping them uh, with their development. And a fabulous quote that I came across in my research, of, it is evident that in spite of yearly heavy, heavy capital input, it has yet not yielded much in return. Those mineral deposits, which were known a decade back, still remain in the top of the list of mineral resources. None of the policy measures appear to have any positive impact on the growth of the mining activity in the near future, and this will perhaps remain to be a sector without any direct return, which will have bearing on the development of the national economy. 
and this was 92 and things haven't really changed significantly since then. So I think we're spot on for what it was like. Um, okay, so my background research, uh, it turns out the general manager of the mine was gonna be going up to the mine for four days at the end of November. So it was fortuitous timing for me, um, but it didn't make it easy because I couldn't just hop on a car with him. I still needed unbelievable amounts of permissions um, from a formal permission from the Nepal Metal Company, general manager, uh, permission from the National Council of Science and Technology, uh, the director general of departments of mine and geology. I needed all of these permission letters. Um, and so it was, again, gonna take a long time to meet everyone, explain what I was doing, what I thought I was doing. Uh, and get permissions. And I also needed trekking permits. And trekking permits are easy to get at all. However, they're very policed, especially I was up near a national park. And if you are in an area that you're not, that is not in your trekking permit, it's bad news. And so um, rereading through my journals, I actually had to slip in the names of the villages that I was going to in the mine and hope that they didn't get X'd out by the, the, the permit department. And thankfully, uh, they did not notice them and they did not cross them out, but that would have been uh, not good news for me getting up there if they had realized that. And it was, I had forgotten that it was so these, my trekking permit, all my letters of permission were so important. I actually locked them up at the schoolhouse until the day we left for the mine, just because I was not gonna have like anything happen to all these pieces that had to fall in place. <clears throat> um, while I was working on this, while I was waiting for the mine uh, general manager to have his trip up there, I did interviews with the Hamal magazine editor, tried to find the author of that magazine article, but couldn't. Um, UN Development Project, International Union for the Conservation of Nature, Department of Mountain Geology, Internal Center for Integrated Mountain Development, and the Nepal Forum for Environmental Journalists, Department of Industry, basically anyone who might know anything about this mine, what was going on up there, um, you know, what the future would look like. And it turns out really no one knew what was going on um, besides nothing was going on. Um, but there were certainly, everyone I talked to was like, let us know what you find. <laughs> um, so history of the mine. The Hyderabad Industries Limited from India found lead and zinc deposits up in the valley, um, up in the Ganesh Mall region in the 1970s, and they explored it with a company out of Quebec. Uh, the first deposit was found at just shy of 15,000 feet. Um, and there are actually six mineralized zones up there. Um, so in 1973, a, a project report was submitted to the government and it was approved um, for that, but the project report said that it was viable only if the infrastructure um, of the road and power was provided by the government. Um, and so in 75, two years later, the government approved the project. And so Nepal Metal Company was formed in 76. Um, so again, 75, the government said, we'll, we can do this and yes, we will build the road and put um, electricity there. In 83, nothing had changed. There still was no road and no power, um, but they knew obviously that there was significant mineralization up there. So uh, the mining company turned to the International Finance Corporation, part of the World Bank, trying to get um, funding from them. The project was approved at 12 million initially. I think it got up to 18 million. Um, the IFC said they would provide $3 million if the infrastructure was completed by the government by 1986. So they had three years uh, to get it done. Didn't happen still. And so the IFC said, well, we're not disinterested. However, we need a UN development project feasibility study uh, before we commit any cash to this. And the road and electricity would be good to have too. So still things are stagnating by 1986. And in 1992, the UN feasibility study was completed. So again, that was the year that I was there. Um, Outcomes of the study was that there was not enough data on the known amount of lead and zinc up there. Um, and so without that known quantity, the UNDP is not providing their equipment, the IFC won't provide the money, the project won't go. Um, so here I come on the scene, like this is kind of, it's, you know, a very fortuitous timing that all of this was in place. They really just needed to know how much ore was up there um, in order to get this project going. And, you know, here comes the American geologist that's gonna log their core and solve the problem for them. <clears throat> um, just to back up a little bit, some really brief Himalayan regional geology, like why are these mountains there? Why are they so big? Why are there mines at 15,000 feet? Um, 70 million years ago, India started fast tracking north towards Eurasia. And these are both continental plates. 
So they're both really buoyant. Um, neither of them wants to go down into the mantle. So uh, if you look at just a generic continent, continent collision zone here on the right, um, two pieces of continental crust, neither of them want to get, go down. There's a, an immense amount of force behind these pieces of crust colliding together, especially Eurasia is big. Um, and so really the only way, way to go is up. Um, and so that's why these continental, continental collisions are so enormous. If you look at a cross section for a generalized cross section through Nepal, um, you can see at the bottom here is the Indian plate. Again, it's cruising northwards, the Eurasian plate um, on the north side of things, the Tibetan plateau. And all of this topography is in between in this collision zone between India uh, and Eurasia. And it's always impresses me that the southern part of Nepal down here, what's labeled as the Terai, incredibly flat, um, as you'll see in just a minute, elevation of about 300 feet. And, and it, as the crow flies in about 200 miles, you go from 300 feet to the top of Mount Everest. <laughs> so again, to give you an idea of, it's like two Mack trucks colliding and neither of them stopping. They're just compressing and, um, and you can see it in the very uh, cartoonized, but all the deformation that happens during this collision. So just some slides here of what it looks like as you go from north to south, no, south to north through Nepal. Um, this is down in the Terai, so again, super flat. And uh, the rice paddies are, um, you know, kind of as I envision them in India, just miles of very flat rice paddies. As you get towards Kathmandu, so kind of partway up the country, it starts getting a little bit hillier. You can see here the rice paddies start getting terraced. Um, again, these are still like not even foothills in the scheme of things in Nepal. Um, and then as you get to the higher mountains, uh, this is, you know, kind of a typical, not even the higher Himalayas, but um, higher mountain valleys. And, you know, when you're trekking, if you've been in there, Trekking in Nepal, you know that you often have a village here and a village here, and the only way to get there is go down and back up again. So it's you know thousands of feet up and down to trek through the country. Um, so here, these are the higher uh, Himalayas here, as seen from Kathmandu. In the middle of this photograph is the smog of Kathmandu, and it's clear you can see the higher mountains in the background. And then this, of course, is um, the Everest region here with you know the highest of the the Himalayas. So a real simple cross section, I don't wanna to spend too long on here through Nepal, but going from the south to the north on the right. Again, here's the, the Indian plate diving under the Eurasian plate. And it's a very complicated collision zone. And the way that a lot of this collision gets accommodated is through these thrust faults. So this main frontal thrust here, main boundary thrust down in the Southern part of Nepal, and then uh, the main central thrust will come into play here for the Ganesh Himal, but that this is sort of up in the, the higher Himalayan region where this thrust fault is. <clears throat> um, here's the geologic map of Nepal. And I like this map because it shows these thrust faults that I just talked about. So the main frontal thrust down here in south, the south side of things where again, things are quite flat. Main boundary thrust is the next one just to the north. Main central thrust is right up here. So again, in, in the higher mountains, it does this fun little jog around Kathmandu. Um, but you know, this is how the accommodation is happening from all the collision zones. If you know, in addition to mountains going up. Um, so the mine, just to, it's not noted, not starred on here. But this square that uh, my cursor is on is Long Tong National Park, that is just to the east of where the mine is. And why I show this is because here's the main central thrust basically running through the national park and uh, the mine sits just a few miles south of that main central thrust zone. Um, all right, so the sciencey part of tonight, um, the, the rocks that are at Ganesh Hall are all metasedentary rocks uh, that have been pretty significantly deformed and also heated up during their metamorphism in fibrolite facies. Um, so 500 plus degrees at C for their uh, temperatures during the metamorphism. Interestingly enough, though, lead isotopes on the ore suggest an age of over 800 million years in for the age of the ore. So, you know, I mentioned India started moving north 70 million years ago. This is another 800 million years before that. So the ore predates any of the mountain formation, um, and it's, it's back from when the sediments were originally deposited on the seafloor you know, well before India was even around. The rocks of the mine, alternating schists and fibrolites, quartzites and um, carbonates. And the carbonates are actually what host the ore. Then I mentioned there's six mineralized zones, <clears throat> all being within one dolomite bearing layer. So again, these 
these would have been flat line sedimentary rocks 800 million years ago. And uh, the ore that is there now was all uh, from the original sedimentary environment. Um, so nothing to do with the creation of the Himalayas. Um, <clears throat> the structure of the mine here, it's all in this really tight syncline. So here's my cartoon version of the syncline. Um, I mentioned that the carbonates were hosting the ore. So this orange layer here is the white dolomite. That's actually the layer that has all the ore in it. There's a little bit in the black dolomite and a lot of the country rock is this garnet mica schist. Um, it's not huge. And that's, this is 500 meters along here, um, along the axis of the fold and about hundred meters wide. So it's, it's not very extensive. Um, sulfides are primarily uh, spalerite for where the zinc is, and also biotite, phlogopite, actinolite, and all the minerals that at that point I had never seen before, but was having to report to the UN for how much percent was in the drill core. <clears throat> um, I know these are really small figures here from this publication in 96. On the right, though, is a map view of the mine. So it's, uh, you know, this bar down here is 100 meters. So this would be your 500 meters, roughly, of the syncline that I just showed you. Um, and then a, a cross section through the middle of this map, this plan view on the right is shown here. And so uh, the main mine is down, the mine um, added is down at the bottom. And all these little plus marks would be where the mineralization intersects with their drill coring. Um, so they estimated again in that just the one that they've explored, one ore body they explored about 1.3 million tons of ore uh, with 13% zinc, 2% lead. So significant, you know, certainly at the time, the largest known metal deposit in the Himalayas. Um, so there's a reason that the UN and the World Bank were taking a look at this. As of November 92, there were 89 underground diamond drilling holes that had been completed in the mine. So here's, again, this, this syncline that um, I showed you before, and these little lines would be all of their drill cores into it. Um, the longest ones went 360 feet into the rock, and they were taking these cores. Some were being sent to Canada to be analyzed. Most of them were sitting in a drill core shack at the mine and uh, estimating lead and zinc based on the mineralogy they were finding in the drill cores. And so, again, UN, the UN Development Project was requiring all this drilling before investment occurred. And so when I was up there in 92, they were not actively expanding the tunnel of the mine. They were just drilling and drilling and drilling and creating all this drill core. Um, one of my favorite quotes for the mine from their, their feasibility study, <laughs> in spite of lower labor productivity, the very low wage rate existing in Nepal makes the project economically viable. <laughs> Not a good sign for your feasibility study to be hanging its hat on that. <laughs> um, <clears throat> All right, so off we go to the mine and my few days that were up there. And I show you two different versions of the same map. I like the topography shown better on the one on the right, but the, the stars are the same for what's, what is where. The Southern star on here is the village, uh, village question mark of uh, Somdong, which is the end of the road. And then the next star up is the, where the Nepal Metal Company mine site actually is. And I put a star up here for this is where Ganesh Mall is. There's a lot of climbing expeditions. So that's kind of where, the, where they're headed to. Um, just north of where the mine actually is. <clears throat> All right, so how you get there, and you know, for those of you who have traveled in Nepal, you know, travel is is not insignificant to get around the country. Um, so I think it is worthwhile to to hit home how difficult it is to get up there. Um, Kathmandu is located right here, and you get fifty five kilometers on the blacktop road, which is smooth sailing. Um, to Trisali Bazaar. And so this is what we did. We I got in a vehicle November 20th, I think it was, with our driver, uh, the general manager of the mine, a mining geologist, a mining architect, and a local police officer that were just driving home who happened to live along the way somewhere. <laughs> um, so there's six of us in the land cruiser um, that headed out. This is, you know, the first couple hours of our journey that, um, to get there. The next many hours were from Trisley Bazaar, so from here um, north to Cyber Basie, and this is a uh, 70 kilometers on an unpaved road um, that Google Maps optimistically says this can take five and a half hours. Uh, it does not, so ignore their timing. Um, and I should say also here, um, pointing out here, Long Tong National Park is right here on the edge. Um, of this map here. So again, this like the mine is over here and the national park is over here. 
uh, and the, so the road partially uh, that we traveled on um, going up in between those two. Uh, and then the last part of the drive is the, the best part from Cyberbase Sea all the way up to Somdong, the end of the road. Uh, I like the zoom in on the right here of this Cyberbase Sea to Somdong, so you can see uh, what it takes to drive all the way there um, on 30 kilometers. This part of the road was actually when it was finally built. It was built by the army, um, which many people in the neighbor in the, the neighboring villages were really skeptical about, wondering what the army was doing there, why there's so many army camps. Why the army built the road? Why wasn't it, you know, the public works? Um, one of the many reasons that people were, you know, really didn't know what was going on up there at the mine. Um, but it took us ten hours to go 155 kilometers um, in dry season, <laughs> and so add in winter or monsoon, and it's near impossible to get up there. Um, and this will come into play as because, as you know, think about all the ore they're extracting up here, and they need to get it to market. It's uh, pretty incredible. So here's Samdong, the end of the road. I can't really call it a town because it's that one building. <laughs> um, we spent the night in this building after our 10 hour drive. I think that was probably our land cruiser recovering from the drive. Um, this is the general manager of the mine, Mr. Chakrabadi, and then the geologist and the, the mining architect. So it was kind of the four of us that finished the rest of the journey from here. So the end of the road is at 10,000 feet, just, almost just shy of 11,000 feet. Uh, your final approach to the next, we spent the night in that building at the end of the road, then we hiked up to the mine, which is officially in the town, again, question mark, of Paiutang. Um, and so it's another four-mile hike, gaining 2,600 feet uh, to get up there. And as you'll see in all these slides, the Nepal Electrical Authority did install electricity all the way up there. So it was not the army, but it was actually more of an official governmental um, body that installed the electricity. But here's the you know sign showing you're at base camp at Samdong. You'll see different spellings because it's all phonetic anyway. Um, but we headed up this valley this direction to get up to the mine. Um, oops, hang on. So here's our hike up. Um, there's the faithful electrical poles heading up for you know thousands of feet up to where the mine is. But kind of typical views as we went up the valley to Paigutang. Uh, here's the general manager and his uh, faithful white hat and the other two guys with us hiking up the trail. You can see, you know, going all the way down the valley. And again, think of the reverse when this is operational, the ore is going back down this valley. Um, so clearly we need to advance beyond the trail. Uh, and it's really cryptic to see, but here's the mining. There's the mining buildings up here in this bottom left photo. Um, and then this piece right here is actually the the debris pile of stuff coming out of the, the mine at it. So this is you know, end of the road, end of the trail. It's not even end of the road uh, for where the mine is. Um, so we hiked up there, I think November 21st in my timeline. And so this is a view of Paigutang. This is the compressor house right here, which is, you know, front and center in all these photos. It's really difficult to see, but the mine at it itself is right on the very right side and kind of the shadow of the slide. Um, the official sign, because, you know, if it's a sign, it's official. Um, I had in my notes, there was actually a, a police station up here too, which I don't remember at all, but apparently it was there. Um, but this is the uh, kind of boarding house down here uh, behind the sign. So the, um, where everyone was staying and where the, where all the meals were eaten. <clears throat> and it was a very, just like any other mining camp, there was TV, there was a ping pong table, you know, <laughs> miles in from the road, miles from a real road. Um, you know, fireplace, there was, yeah, it was kind of like any other mining camp. <laughs> um, the afternoon we got up there, we hiked up to the main at it. Um, so here's the entrance, uh, right. And, uh, you can see there's a railroad track at the time. I think it was the only two kilometers of railroad track in the country of Nepal. <laughs> um, and so some of the workers here, the, the mining company outfitted them all with headlamps and raincoats and boots and I was actually impressed all the employees there, except for one mining architect, were Nepalese. Um, so it's contrary to a lot of the other uh, mining activities that I was starting to research in the country that, you know, with the Indian investment, it was all Indian employees, but it was actually all Nepalese up there. Um, they, of course, were wondering what I was doing up there, and I was wondering what they were doing up there, and, you know, <laughs> um, but they're a great group of people. And um, so here you can see the workers coming out of the mine with these full rail cars and again they're not actively blasting to extend this two kilometer at it they're uh, this is all part of their drilling operations to try and estimate how much ore um, they're finding there 
Uh, the next day we woke up, a beautiful day. And so here again, a view from the, from the boarding house, but there's the compressor building here. This is the headlamp issuing building. Um, and then this, the tailings pile or the debris pile uh, kind of here on the right. And as the photo on the right shows that debris pile better. Um, everything just taken out of the mine, dumped over the edge. This river is just water coming out of the mine as well. Um, and again, you can see power lines going all over the place up here. Um, <clears throat> and there's, not, you can sort of see some water pipes going through here. So, you know, everything is up on the ground uh, to make this all work in the mine. Um, again, this is the building here of, uh, you know, where everyone was staying. There are about 50 workers up there full time. At the time, they were envisioning it got to be 700 when they were fully operational. Um, at the time, though, everyone was staying up here at the at the mine site in this building. And so there's, yeah, this rock building is where the, the ping pong table was and the TV <laughs> uh, and the dining hall. <clears throat> so a view down on camp, this is more like the residential side of things at, uh, you know, 14,000 feet. And then uh, we hiked up above the mine and you can see in the background, the peak of Ganesh Himal. And again, a lot of um, exp climbing expeditions were heading um, up there as well. Looking down on the mine added here, you can see the railroad tracks. Um, this is, I think, the headlamp issuing building, which is shockingly big for just issuing headlamps. Um, and then the rail cars out on the edge of that cliff there. And so they would, again, um, do their drilling, remove all the material that wasn't part of the drill core, throw it in these rail, rail cars, um, run it out here, and just tip it over the edge. Um, here's the general manager on the right, and the architect, and the uh, the geologists looking at some of the some of the rocks. Um, we did go into the mining at it uh, with headlamps, and that is where they had me measuring strike and dip on folds and uh, plunges on folds and you know structural geology I'd had, but in Minnesota where the rocks are flat, and so I'd never actually done structural geology. But they were taking my strikes and dips and writing them in their notebooks for the UN. I was like, oh, this is scary. <laughs> Just a preview of things to come. Um, the next day we woke up to this in the end of November, and there's six inches of snow, howling winds, uh, 15 degrees, and the power was out. Uh, and the power actually goes out quite a bit up there, but certainly in conditions like this. Uh, so there, there's no generator up there, only compressors. And so when the power is out, everything stops and the miners will come out of the tunnel, but just go hang out by the fire, wait for the power to come back on and go back in and start drilling. Um, and so this, again, here's that compressor house. This is the where the, the rail cars would be sitting up in here. And so everything is at a total standstill waiting for the power to come back on. Um, and in this day, actually, the climb, British climbing ex expedition came, ended up coming into camp. They were driven off the, the peak like 200 meters from the top because of the storm. Um, and as much, you know, the protection we had was better than anything they had in the mountain, even though we had no heat and the wind was blowing through that rock building. Um, it was pretty grim, but as soon as the power comes back on, the workers are back up there. And I think at this point, they've got to be pushing their rail cars because uh, they couldn't get the, the little engine, little engine that could to work through all the snow. So they're trying their best to push their rail cars out in the very snowy conditions. Um, but again, power was on and off and on and off. And that's just kind of the way of life um, up there at the mine site. Uh, so we then left the next day, or as our intended departure day anyway, and it certainly is, um, you know, we didn't totally abort the mission because of the snowstorm, but it was it was not a bad thing to be leaving when we did. So this is, uh, as we headed down the valley, again, here is that uh, debris pile, so you can see some of the fresher things that they had dumped on top of since the snow fell. And the buildings are really hard to pick out in here, but they'll be sort of in this part of the of the slide. Um, and then this is a photo from Zomdong back to the end of the road. Uh, looking back up the valley and see how much more snow is in the peaks then as well. So uh, we hiked down and we waited because um, there was free cell phones. We had an arranged time for the car to come meet us at the end of the road. Um, and I'll explain a little bit later, they could not make it there to pick us up. So we then had to start hiking out further. <laughs> Um, but just some of the mine operation details that I got from the general manager when we were up there and the, um, the architect and the engineers, they had hoped to be fully operational by 95, so three years after I had been there. Uh, some of the key components they were missing to be fully operational were that they needed a mill site, and they were hoping to do that 500 meters below the adit, so in this valley that you could see in the slide. Um, Obviously, they would need to build the road uh, up to where the mill is, which was going to be, um, you know, significant in extension of the road. Uh, their solution for how to get the ore down there was just a steep conveyor belt um, to carry it all the way down to 
where the mill is from the mine site and uh, the crushing, grinding, floating, all that sort of thing would happen um, down there at the mill site. And that's also where they would put the housing for the 700 workers they envisioned uh, being there when they needed them full time. <clears throat> Uh, they did recognize that the tailings were some of the largest problems facing the operations, and uh, so they, you know, the architect was like, "We're working on that, um, trying to figure out how to, you know, put all their tailings uh, ponds in this incredibly steep valley." Uh, and then, interestingly enough, their business model was to send the ore concentrates to India for smelting, um, which is, you know, over a thousand miles away. Reverse the road, the trip in that I described to you, um, but even farther down to the Indian border. So they would truck it down to the Indian border and then send it off to smelters in India. And uh, it was fascinating the different reasonings for that and that um, uh, they, they honestly said they'd rather India have the environmental problems of the smelter than have Nepal deal with it. Um, and in a fascinating business model, India paid at the time anyway, 50% more than an international market value for lead and zinc. So uh, it was gonna work out well for them anyway. So. Uh, yeah, I mean, they had to, you know, build the road, get the trucks, all that sort of thing to get the ore down to India, but yet still economically, you know, work for them. <clears throat> so some of the infrastructure issues that I noticed, and again, this is, you know, very qualitative undergrad geology view of what was going on up there at the mine. Um, you know, it's obviously an issue that the power gets cut when the wind blows, you know, here at 14,000 feet, the wind does blow. Um, and there's no generator up there, so it's totally dependent on electricity for all its operations. I mean, they've got a fireplace in the bunkhouse and, and the cooking can happen, but in terms of anything um, operational, it's not going to happen. <clears throat> so it's, it, I mean, it's comical how much they just come in and out, in and out, waiting for the power to come back on so they can get back to work. Um, other infrastructure issues, again, that snowstorm we experienced closed the road, as we realized as we got down here, Samdong, and the road sat there for a couple hours and our car never appeared. So we're like, all right, guess we'll start hiking. Um, hiked all the way out to about where Gotlong is, about halfway down that road. And there were a lot of army camps all along this road because the army built the road. Um, and so we were like post holing through knee deep snow, trees had fallen across the road. Um, and we finally got to an army camp, spent the night. Uh, we spent the next day waiting for the car. The car still didn't appear. So we're like, all right, we're gonna continue hiking. So we hiked all the way out to Cyberbase. And at that point, um, I, being the white American, got a ride with another army general down to Dunche, and the other crew, rest of the crew eventually made their way down there. And then they hooked up with their car and went back to Kathmandu. Um, and that, that's when I went off to the Long Tong to do the trek there. Um, but the road is a big issue, um, especially that last little bit. So the general manager, Mr. Chakrabarty, foresaw snow plows, sand and salt trucks, graders, keeping the road open year round. Um, you know, again, the problem is that while the army built the road, the jurisdiction is with the Nepalese road maintenance, sort of their YDOT, and, um, you know, they're not locally situated at all. So it would be a lot to maneuver to get all the support they need up there, especially if they're counting on um, Nepalese road maintenance, not, not their own company maintenance <clears throat> to keep that road open. Other infrastructure issues, um, earthquakes. And so again, this is, this is the house where we all were living up at the mine and all the workers live and uh, not particularly earthquake safe. And remember those big thrust faults that I mentioned, that's just um, to the north of where the mine is. Um, there was a huge earthquake in 2015. This is in Long Tong National Park, so just east of the mine. And on the left is a village that was thriving until the earthquake, and the right is the village after the earthquake and all the landslides and just decimated it. So um, the mine is still standing, but they definitely suffered some uh, structural damage during that earthquake. So, uh, you know, that thrust fault and the, the earthquakes in the Himalayas are not anything uh, to make light of at all. Um, another great quote in my research from the, the UN Development Project Environmental in Impact Report, because Ganesh Himal is an underground mine, most of the associated environmental problems should be controllable and therefore not a serious threat to the local environment and ecology of the region. Um, so I think at this point, I started becoming very jaded in the science that was being done at the, the UNDP, <laughs> but it's all right. Um, some of the, the highlights of their report was that there was going to be no deforestation at the mine, which granted, you know, by the adit, they're well above tree line, but down where they wanted to build the, the mine and the mill and house 700 workers was down in a rhododendron forest. Uh, the report said there's going to be no aquatic life impact, um, which, you know, again, I'm not an a biologist by any means, I cannot imagine the streams out there are sterile. There's gotta be something going on. 
I said there's no wildlife impact, um, and it's you know not the tropical jungles, but there's definitely wildlife there. They said categorically no plant life impacts, um, but the, even folks at the mine said that you know obviously this uh, debris pile out here is is changing changing things in that. Um, which also ties into the insignificant landscape deformation. You know, everyone at the mine was like, 10 years ago, it looked totally different. Um, so it just seemed like a lot of the points at the UNDP uh, environmental impact report were um, not realistic and maybe not ground truth. I, I don't know how much time they spent up there when they were writing that report. Other things not mentioned in the UND re UNDP report uh, is discussing increased sediment load in the river, which is up in the valley that we hiked up to where the mine is, the Milong River. Um, and this feeds into the Trisley River, and there is a huge hydro project that um, has gotten even bigger since I was there. Uh, and so the issues of silting up that hydro project um, were not even thought of by the UN Development Project. Um, and then health impacts of surface water consumption, whether it's contamination from just sediments and silts, um, or if any of the, the lead and the zinc from the tailings mines, I mean, all water consumption in Nepal is straight out of the river um, and everything you do is in the river, from the river. So uh, it's, it's, you know, unrealistic to think that what's going on at the head, headwaters of this stream are not going to impact things downstream. And so health impacts on the villages um, were not mentioned at all in the report either. So the impacts of my study, well, I left a final copy of my report, which it was Nepal in 92, I hand wrote and then had to go find a computer lab in Kathmandu that had electricity <laughs> that I could type this up on and pay per hour to type up my report um, and then find a Xerox that actually had electricity that I could make copies. But I left it with the UNDP and the IUCN in Kathmandu. I did not leave one at the mining company again, you know, feeling like a terrible person that I had this man bring me up to his mine and he didn't really know what I was doing or what I was going to write about. Um, the UNDP uh, encouraged me to mail a copy to the director of the UNDP program, Bureau for Program Policy and Evaluation in New York, which I did. And uh, he then forwarded on to the manager of the Energy and Natural Resource Group of the UNDP and the chief of the West and South Asia Division Regional Bureau for Asia and the Pacific, the UNDP. Um, so it circulated farther than I ever anticipated. Uh, and I never heard anything after that. And I honestly did not expect to hear anything after that. Um, you know, it was, it's not, it was not a scientific, you know, quantitative study by any means. There's my observations four days at the mine site. Um, but what is there now? Well, uh, still the same old, same old, nothing really has changed. This article is from uh, 2020 in the Himalayan News Service that the state-owned mining company remains closed. So it actually closed around 2005, and so the official party line is that the civil war going on in Nepal made the work very difficult, um, and so work has never resumed. <clears throat> and um, so a photo from their article, uh, obviously much warmer time of year than when I was there, but things kind of still look very much the same. Uh, and then here's another photo again, like, you know, straight out of the boarding house view, like what I had again, here's the compressor house, there's the headlamp issuing house, the, uh, the river coming out and then that tailings pile. Um, and so this was, I think, from 20, 2008, maybe. Um, so like nothing has moved or changed since 1992. Um, interestingly enough, though, the mining company, while they're closed, still has employees and they still have seven employees living at the mine at the time that this article was, came out. Um, kind of hoping that maybe they can start drilling again. <laughs> Poor guys. I think there's a couple, um, you know, office folks back in Kathmandu, but they they still got drivers and tunnel diggers sitting up there at uh, 14,000 feet, hoping for the day uh, when when funding comes through. <clears throat> um, so takeaways for me on this, you know, I went in kind of wanted to be your idealistic liberal arts student wanting to, you know, crucify a company for doing terrible things to the environment. And it became really re readily apparent that it wasn't going to happen. So it definitely shifted in sort of environmental policy, politics, balancing resource management and developing countries. Um, and so the strong need for an environmental component in Nepal's development projects and to, but for resource management and development uh, to proceed hand in hand. And so just the collaboration between all the agencies like the IUCN and all the different funding agencies in the government um, to, you know, to do, to, to do the best research and the best development. Um, and obviously now, you know, it's, it's really complicated in developing countries. Um, but I think the biggest thing for me, you know, especially now looking back at the, uh, the UN 
feasibility reports and environmental impact studies, just the need for good science behind international funding projects, um, you know, regardless of which way they go, whether they're funded or not. Um, I mean, it, it honestly is, it, it's laughable to, to look at the science that went into that uh, feasibility study and the environmental impact report um, for the Ganesh Mall mine. Um, so final quote for you for takeaways, although it is wrong to squander the God-given capital resources or consider earth as a legitimate quarry, it is also a crime against humanity to ignore the need of an aspiring society and close our mind to the bare necessity at the pretext of conservation or environmental protection. So I think just really summarize well kind of my shift back to, you know, it's a bigger picture rather than just going after the, you know, the, the bad guy who's um, extracting things from the earth. So with that, I'll take questions. Mike. So Liz, one question that comes to mind, the water you were drinking was coming out of the mine. Correct. And <laughs> I'm sure it never got tested for heavy metals, but it's in a lead zinc mine. Correct. <laughs> My okay. kids turned so, out okay. So the question is, <laughs> is, what was your concern about that? Oh, no. And, mm -hmm. and so you need to repeat the, I don't think Zoom could hear you. Okay, so the question was about water quality when I was at the mine, and it's the water was coming out of the, the lead zinc mine, and was there concern of um, safety issues drinking the water? And, and it was, you know, I was treating it for Giardia, but not for, for lead and zinc consumption. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, luckily I was there for four days, and, you know. <laughs> I was sick all the time in Nepal, so it was probably just another reason to be sick. <laughs> yeah, but no, it, I mean, it's shocking again that like water quality is, you know, well, water quality is, is not thought of at the time anyway in Nepal much at all. I mean, everything goes in the rivers <laughs> and everything, you know, then you, everything comes out of the rivers. So um, yeah, it's it. <laughs> so Mike Abbott is going to see any questions. Okay. You don't have to um, stop sharing, or you, well, you don't have to go back to Zoom. I don't know. Oops. No. Liz, yeah. Whatever possessed anybody to originally find any kind of deposit at fourteen thousand feet, up, you know, valleys, no roads. So, how did this mine? Uh, Get discovered in the first place? Great question. Uh, the question was about how the mine got discovered in the first place, um, being at 14,000 feet days, you know, from the end of the road, especially at that time. Um, luckily, it does crop out at the surface. Um, so that syncline fold does go, you know, uphill. And so they could um, find it then. And, you know, I don't, I can't imagine it was climbers that all of a sudden are like, oh, look at all this spiller that happens to be here. Um, but there's probably enough traffic through there. I mean, certainly the porters think the mine is there for gemstones. Um, and so they're always looking for gemstones as they're passing through and maybe, you know, eventually found its way to a mining company in India where they're like, oh, I know what that is and what that means. Um, yeah, but how it was first found in 1970, I don't, I don't really know the story behind that. But it, luckily, again, it crops out at the surface. Um, so that'll help them <clears throat> track it down. Electricity generated. Is that hydro? Uh, the electricity at the mine, how it was generated, it was probably hydro, uh, especially with that hydro project downstream. And what that was operational, it has grown. There's been a few more stages of that since, um, but the first stage of that hydro project was going. And so uh, my guess is it's going to be hydro <clears throat> trying to get its way up the power lines. <laughs> Uh, the mineral sphalerite, uh, zinc sulfide, the question, sorry, was um, other places to get zinc from. That, yeah, it's it's not an uncommon mineral. Um, and so I'm trying to think of other big lead zinc deposits. Franklin, New Jersey. Franklin, New Jersey. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Drive right up to it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's not, it, I mean, to having concentrations that it's economically viable is obviously a more uncommon situation, um, but it's not, this is like by no means the only lead zinc mine in the world. <laughs> yeah. 
I, I know. Yeah, it does. <laughs> Question. So you mentioned okay. early that one of your objectives of the study was to identify an approximate uh, amount of ore located in the in the area. And I, I didn't hear whether you actually did that. Um, I did spend an afternoon in the drilling shed with the geologists um, trying to estimate from their drill core. And you know, he's like, what percentage phlogopite? I'm like, oh, is that the red one? Uh, 10%? <laughs> so I, I had in my journals that we logged like 300 feet of core um, that would have gone in their journals to go off to the UN to, again, provide that they had a significant amount of deposits there. Um, to, make, to make the infrastructure investments, you have to be assured of this, whether you're building the oil or whatever, you've got to rest assured. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, hello, Mike. <laughs> so I definitely did not solve that. Yeah, I, ha I have uh, <laughs> and, one know, and one now. Oh, yeah. No, 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 I'm, I'm still here. Uh, yeah, I was waiting I for you to that. ask about it. So, yeah. Okay, so, yeah. Mike, we got one more question in the room that was to be asked. Yeah. For um, the, uh, the work for Stand Up, is it primarily about folks today from local communities or local far away? What are their perceptions of the mindset? Um, the question was about the, the local workforce, where they were from, and perceptions of the mind. They were very local, and I can't remember what. Um, you know, sort of subgroup of Nepalese they were, but they were definitely, you know, they weren't as close to being, you know, Tibetan on that close to the border as you could be, but still Nepalese. Um, Hmong might have been their um, ethnic origin. Anyway, um, so the majority of them were, the, and they, I don't think they really wondered much about, you know, perceptions of the mind. You know, they were happy to be employed, even though they were getting paid like 50 cents a day, but it was a job and um, I don't, they were not, you know, getting trucked in from Southern Nepal or anything like that. I, I was really surprised that they were seemingly from local villages and yeah. And they seemed to be really treated well and got along really well with the, the few, you know, sea level folks that were coming in and staying in the, in the boarding house with them. I mean, it was very collegial, um, which was great to see. <clears throat> Do you want to ask Mike if there's any more questions? Yeah, Mike, are there Zoom questions? Yeah, um, there was one question here, which was, uh, what are the uh, silver and gold credits in the ore, if there are any? Um, I don't think there was much silver and gold in there that was reported in any of their mineralogy. There were some sulfides, but not silver and gold that I remember. Okay, and I, I just had a personal question for you. Uh, what was the essence of your report? What did, if you're willing to share that, what did you have to say about what you saw there? Maybe you don't want to comment. <laughs> um, it honestly, in my final report, it's very similar to what I told you guys here. Um, and okay. that, you know, I, I, yeah, that I had, and there's, you know, my personal sort of reflections were more in the postscript than the actual report, but yeah, that, uh, at the you know the very end in the appendix, I said I had wanted to take a you know more of a Western view on a on a operating mineral exploration um, procedure to you know see what they were doing wrong and and violating, but quickly learned that it wasn't going to happen because there's nothing to violate, and they also really weren't operating. <laughs> Is there likely to be any? Um, oh. Do you see any chance that that actually is going to ha uh, be? Um, Continue to mention there are actually still people up there waiting. Uh, is is that likely to be a, like a forever wait? Uh, it might be a forever wait to those poor guys sitting up there. Um, I don't envision that this is going to fly unless you know zinc prices explode. But um, there's just so much. I mean, none of the infrastructure has changed from what I can tell since 1992. So I don't. I think it's. I think it's done. <laughs> if I were to guess. Yeah, question in the room. Are there any physical effects that you notice? 
question was physical effects working at the altitude. Um, I am sure the Nepalese workers are all very acclimated, much like the, you know, the trekkers and the, or the Sherpas for the Everest expeditions. They just, it's life is normal. I definitely notice um, I, my one clear memory is when it was the power was out and it was 15 degrees sitting in my sleeping bag with all my layers on eating cookies. And I had to like stop because I was running out of breath and you know, I was like chewing like. <laughs> 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 um, and I wasn't up there for that long, but I, yeah, the Nepalese were so acclimated to all the high altitude that um, they that there's not an issue for that for them that I could tell. Great question though. Cynthia. How did you get supplies up there? food and fuel. Uh, yeah, the question is how you get supplies up there. Uh, everything is carried up. Fuel, fuel food, TV, ping pong table, <laughs> railroad tracks. I mean, some of it may have been helicoptered in, but like the day-to-day, -day, I mean, beyond like some of the big pieces moving in, it like the railroad cars, I would imagine, would have been helicoptered in, but everything is carried uphill. By people or By animals? people, by people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> In some parts of the country, it might be done by yaks, but there's there's not yaks in this part of Nepal. So it's all manpower carrying it up. Yeah, right. Could you describe for us what you were eating? <laughs> Question is what I was eating when I was at the mine, when I wasn't getting out of breath eating cookies. Um, it's every every meal in Nepal is dal bot. So it's curry, lentils, uh, curried vegetables and rice, and probably not much meat. I mean, meat is very expensive there anyway, and especially up at the mine to get it there. I'm sure it's just um, potatoes and maybe a cauliflower if you're lucky, and some lentils and some rice. <laughs> That's all you got. <laughs> uh, it's only two times a day. They they really only eat that two times a day. Yeah, <laughs> not <laughs> thankfully not three. <laughs> There was one more question. Yes, Mike, go ahead. There was one more question uh, from the Zoom audience. Um, uh, if you briefly touched on it, but the question was, how does the ore get down? And the fact is, is that, uh, well, why don't you, I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, um, so the drill cores now would have been carried out to the road and then shipped off to Canada. Um, and eventually they were going to build, they had envisioned building like a, you know, conveyor belt to bring it downhill to the mine mill site, um, which would be where the road would be extended to. Um, and so, and it also, they also envisioned, I forgot to mention, a similar kind of rope tow uphill for the workers. So the 700 workers down by the, the mill site to get up to them rather than making them, they were nice not going to make them hike up every day to, or every shift, <laughs> um, but have some sort of rope tow to get them up there. But yeah, the, the ore would be mechanically brought downhill and then in theory, you know, meeting up with the road and getting into the truck is off to, off to India. The one comment you, you, you actually made the comment about the tailings, and it looked like there was a huge pile of tailings just from kind of the preparatory stuff. But once, once it got into production, uh, the tailings pile had to be, you know, it would be enormous, and they didn't even consider that an issue. Uh, the question was about the tailings that would be generated when they were operational. Uh, it they did recognize that as being their big problem, um, but they had not come up with a solution for it yet. And I can't remember the estimates for how many, you know, square kilometers of tailings that were going to be generated when they're fully operational. But it's, uh, yeah, just from the the little bit they've done, which is a you know what a small fraction of what they would be doing when they were operational. Uh, yeah, so those would probably get sent down the hill. Well, I don't know. I mean, they might get sent down the hill with the ore. It might just get keep getting dumped over the edge and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. It's the road of tailings. <laughs> Dan. Uh, yeah, the question is about the core and sort of 
more details on that. Yeah, they were, you know, they drilled up to what 350 feet into the tunnels and I don't know how many, you know, different places. So they just kind of just randomly and it's interesting they only explored that one deposit. They knew of the, the five others. Um, so, and I never found any clear reason why they weren't looking at the other five in terms of especially trying to assess how much was there because, uh, you know, you think that would add on to how much the UN might be interested in funding. Um, but yeah, they, from what I remember, you know, they would, they would pull out these 360 foot long core pieces into the, into the core shack. And I think they must have had them or it might have been a little bit too uh, for you know too much forethought for them. They might have sent it all off to Canada and just you know just pick and choose which one goes to Canada and which one stays. I don't know. I mean, it was not very systematic at all. So um, I would hate to think that they had some you know true process to what went to Canada and what didn't. <clears throat> yeah, question. It just seems like a big stretch to ever make that mine production to ship from. Up in the Himalayas to Canada. Yes. It seems it, like a stretch. Yeah. The comment was it seems like a stretch for this mine. It does. And their numbers still have worked out that they thought it was going to be, you know, a 15% return on their $18 million investments. Um, but uh, I don't know. I feel like they might have missed a few line items in that. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. It, it was, they had high hopes, have high hopes. It sounds like if they're still employing people there. It's, you know, so it was, it was, crazy for me to be there, you know, as a stupid 20 year old American to be like, do you not see what's really going on here? You know, but they, they really believed in it. And there was a lot of national pride. I mean, they were like, this could be the first big, uh, you know, lead zinc deposit, big, you know, metal deposit that's, that's developed in our country. So they are really hoping to, you know, plant a big Nepalese flag in that and for, for their national pride. Yeah. To follow up on that, it just seems like maybe the motivation was commissions on raising the capital uh yeah the comment was commissions on raising the capital was the motivation and yeah maybe and <laughs> yeah who knows <clears throat> another question i can't remember earlier on the report the comment about the cost of labor uh-huh phenomenally low yeah Yes, the, the question about the cost of labor, and, and yes, I saw, I found in my notes for my research that the the you know the average miner up there was probably earning fifty cents a day, and I think the mining architect and geologist were probably earning two dollars a day. I mean, so obviously a lot more, but boy, not a lot. <laughs> yeah, I have. I... Uh, there's a question of other productive mines in the area. Uh, no, and I don't really know of any that yeah there's no other productive mines in and around there you know there's that marble quarry i almost studied there's a few other economic resources of minerals in the country but it's not making a big dent in there <laughs> yeah I, I was going to ask a related question uh liz is there any uh actual mining that's uh, productive mining going on in nepal at all as far as you know Yeah, that's a great question. I should have, you know, just done some quick research. The two that I know of are Ganesh Himal, that's still sitting stagnant. And then that marble quarry that I was studying just south of Kathmandu actually got the Supreme Court shut it down for environmental protection reasons um, in, I think, 2015. And it took a while because when I was there in 92, um, all the, the environmental groups were expecting it to be shut down in 92. And the, the Supreme Court finally overruled by 2015 the you know they had all the permissions from the department of mines and geology but the supreme court said nope you can't do this anymore it's you know too environmentally fragile there and they shut it down so those are the two i know of and certainly those were the two when i was brainstorming um projects there that you know nothing else came on the list of like oh then there's also this big mine here i just yeah nothing large scales happening <laughs> and but the technical complications and hurdles that have to happen in that country are immense so i'm not surprised <clears throat> right so i'm guessing there's no labs at all that are doing that same how did they i mean they're very exact numbers where was all that done and how many samples did they actually send the question about where all the analyses were being done and how much they sent um the originally it was most of it was done from Canada and, and the reason that it was sent to Canada was one of the initial explored um, exploratory companies along with um, the Indian company was from Canada and then that Canadian company kind of changed tracks and pulled out 
um, but I think they were still doing the the analysis on on and some of it might have been done in India too. So it's not being done in Nepal. Like the <clears throat> the mine and geology department doesn't have that capability or didn't back then. Yeah, so there's all being sent out. I don't know how much of the core got shipped out. I mean, they clearly still had a lot of it in their core shack, and it's not like it got sent back. So <laughs> yes. Yeah, a question on the stream that's coming out of the mine area um, and any effects on villages and towns. At the time, there were um, just some army camps that were just downstream, but, uh, you know, it it will get more diluted the farther down you get, but you know it eventually comes 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 to some significant villages. Um, and as far as I know, you know, it wasn't like you got to the area and recognized there were some serious issues, health issues going on with all the children in the villages. Um, but I did not know of anyone. I mean, the UN didn't even think even think that any kind of contamination could be an issue. So at the time, no one was studying any health issues or health effects on villages downstream. <clears throat> so I, I don't know. The source of the water was out of the mine, the, in the mine. Mm -hmm. well, it, it had to be carried a bunch of oh, yeah. bad stuff. In <laughs> Maybe that's why the streams were sterile and there was going to be yeah. no impact on the, on the water <laughs> chemistry. <laughs> Awesome. So uh, if there, I assume no more questions and uh, if there are, you can come up and ask Liz. I wanna thank everyone who came. I wanna thank our Zoom audience. Lastly, I wanna thank our speaker, a small thank you. present for you. <laughs> thank you. I think it'll be meaningful. <laughs> so join me in uh, thanking mm -hmm. Dr. King. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks everyone for coming. And so the drill with the chairs is the usual thing. And there's still some hummus and things to snack on while we get everything cleaned up. And uh, June 6th, the Great Bonneville Flood. Thanks, Liz.